Good morning and welcome. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion on considerations of the adolescent brain in regards to problematic sexual behavior of youth. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. Excuse me, if you have any other uh, difficulties or cannot see these slides, uh, please don't hesitate to send us a tech support request via email to milfamln at gmail.com. As some of you have already done, we look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversa conversation and for questions. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen, and then from there you can select the chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, please be sure to select the all panelists and attendees response option. You can find that at the drop down menu right above where it says type message here. This just ensures everyone who's on today's webinar can view these comments and questions in the chat pod as we go through our discussion today. We'll also be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. Also note that you can find and download the slides as well as the event resources and materials on our event page and that link is located in the chat pod. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD-USDA partnership for military families, and our passion is to, to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. It's my pleasure to turn things over now to my colleague, Kaylin Goebel. She's the program coordinator with the MFLN uh, Family Development Team, and she'll also be our moderator, moderator today. Kaylin? Good morning, everyone, or hello, good day. We thank you all for joining us today. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker and presenter, Renee Roman. Um, just a little bit of background about Renee before she begins her presentation. She is a practicing New York State licensed social worker with over 20 years of experience, and she is currently employed as a consultant and trainer. She attended Alfred University for her bachelor's degree and went on to obtain her master's in social work from Sunny in Albany with a concentration in children and family work. She has practiced for several, several years in Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland, and has served as a director of clinical services with the START Children's Center, which opened in November of 1998. She then went on to serve as executive director of the Child Advocacy Center. Ms. Roman has also practiced as a primary forensic interviewer for the agency, and she is one of the original authors of the New York State Forensic Interviewing Best Practices. She is trained in foris forensic interviewers since 2003 and is a trainer in problematic sexual behavior focusing on cognitive behavioral therapy for adolescents. She has been treating youth with problematic sexual behavior and training on this topic for over five years, and we are glad to welcome her to continue her trainings um, and webinars on the topic today. So with that, I am happy to turn things over to Renee to begin today's presentation. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I really want to uh, Welcome all of you who are here live and all those you may be listening to this recording later on. Um, adolescents always feel as if adults don't understand them. So I thank you for taking this opportunity to learn a little bit more about them and um, taking some time to, to try and understand them. They can be a, under, a difficult crew. I also want to thank um, all of the folks at uh, NCSBY, the National Center on the Behavior, Sexual Behavior of Youth, um, all those folks who came before me who started this program, who have worked tirelessly to improve the system response to youth with problematic sexual behavior um, and adolescents with illegal sexual behaviors. I am merely riding the coattails of some pretty wonderful people and um, some pretty amazing work. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about our adolescents and what we're talking about today. Um, we're going to cover lots of information, but the very first thing I would like to do, well, well, let me, I guess I will talk to you a little bit about this. Um, first thing I want to go over sort of what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about adolescent development. We're going to talk about sexual development of adolescents. We're gonna talk a little bit about risk assessments and recidivism for those who've engaged in problematic or illegal sexual behaviors. Um, we're gonna spend a bit of time talking about some recommended levels and types of care for these youth. 
And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about engaging adolescents and involving their caregivers um, in that process of providing them treatment and also in assessment. So we have a pretty full agenda and a lot to get through in a brief period of time. So without further ado, let's move ahead. Again, all those wonderful folks um, at NCSBY. If you've never visited their website, I really encourage you to do so. There's some wonderful information available to folks. Um, there's actually a section on this website that's also great for caregivers. Um, so if you have families who have questions about problematic or illegal sexual behaviors, there's actually a section just for them to be able to look at. And coming soon will also be a section for youth. Um, so. A lot, lots going on, lots developing, and a section for the military is my understanding also she'll be coming. Um, so as we move forward in taking this perspective on our adolescents and understanding everything that's going on with them, the first thing I'd like to do is find out a little bit about you. So we do have a few polls for you. Um, so the first poll is, how much experience do you have working with adolescents? Please indicate the answers to these polls by clicking on the response and hitting the submit button below the poll so we can see how much experience you all have um, from no experience to two years, um, you know, up to five years experience, three and a half to 10 years experience, or, you know, four up and on to 11 plus. I see some folks are putting in some responses here. So it looks like we have um, about half of the folks have a good bit of experience over four and a half to 11, 11 plus years experience in working with adolescents. So that's great. So a lot of this uh, you guys will have some information on. Um, let's also talk a little bit about um, when you were a teen. So let's kind of get in our heads as we are teens. When you were a teenager, what was most important to you? Was it your family? Was it your friends? Was it your grades and how you were doing in school? Was it that person you were dating? Was it just about fitting in and, and being like everybody else? Or were you that adolescent that wanted to stand out and be different? Again, if you could click your response and hit the submit button, that would be fantastic. Ah, about half of you agree your friends were the things that were most important to you as you were um, growing through your adolescence. Um, you know, those lower numbers, again, the person you were dating, yeah, about 10%, right? Fitting in is about 15%. So yeah, the, the reality is, is all of those things that I asked you about, about what was most important are all things that are important to our adolescents even if they don't let us know, even if they don't want us to know that we are important to them as their parents or as their caregivers or that grades matter, um, all of those things are important to our adolescents. And then my last question for you all is when you were a teenager, when you think about those teenage years, how do you feel about that? Uh, first response, you know, they were the best. I would go back in a heartbeat if I could to being a teenager again. The next is, oh, I do my best to never even think about them. It was awful. It was terrible. And then the third response might be somewhere in the middle. I have some good memories, but I wouldn't want to do it again. Let's see how you all felt about your adolescence. Mm. Yeah, about three fourths of us say, yeah, I have some good memories, but you know, I, I wouldn't want to do it again. Um, wow, a good 20% of you would go back in a heartbeat to your teenage years. I love it. And about 10% are feeling that it was pretty terrible and, and I would never ever want to do that again. Yeah, we all have a really mixed reaction to this time in our lives. It's, it's a really difficult time, you know, and, and as adults, we have the gift of age and perspective. And what we really need to keep in mind is our teens don't have that gift. That is not available yet to them. Um, and so when things are happening in their lives and they're feeling about things or they're getting reactions and consequences for things or their peers are reacting in certain ways to them, they feel like it is always going to be this way, that it will never change. So in that moment, in their adolescence, things are always going to be this way and they don't see any change or if it's negative hope for the future and if it's positive that that those good things will ever end for them right so 
lots going on in our teenage years. All right. As I go through the next several slides, I want you guys to kind of keep these questions in the back of your brain. Those ones some I just asked, asked you about, you know, what was important to you when you were a teenager? Who was important to you when you were a teenager? When you were a teenager, what kind of decisions were you making? Were you always making the best choices? If you're honest with yourselves, did you always make the best and safest choice? And when you got in trouble, how did you react? What did you do? What was your response when adults found out that you had done something that you shouldn't have been doing? All these I want you to kind of reflect on because they're gonna be important as we go forward. Um, What's going on with our teenagers? What might be different than even when many of you on here today were teenagers? And I would hazard a guess lots and lots of things. I have sort of two sets of children. I have, um, you know, I had my children, I had two children, and then 10 years later, I had my third child. And I will tell you, my third child and raising him, even in that 10 year change, um, vastly different world he grew up in than his brother and sister grew up in. Lots of things are changing for our kids and, and things to kind of keep in mind. The age of puberty, and we'll talk a little bit about that and sexual development, our age for sexual activity and the types of sexual activity that kids are engaging in. Oh, the access to technology, everything that's going on with technology for sure. Um, you know, the ability to access knowledge is wonderful, right? We have this great ability to, at our fingertips. And even for our kids who are still too young to type, they can just ask Google, ask Surrey, right? To answer their questions for them. Knowledge is everywhere, but unfortunately that also means our kids have access to sexual knowledge and to sexual content, unless we do appropriate things to control that. The way our kids communicate is different now than, than it was in the past. Um, a lot of our communication now is done through electronic devices as opposed to face-to-face -face communication. How our families are composed, what our families look like, you know, um, there was a time when it was unusual to be the teenager in school whose parents weren't together and there was a divorce in the family. And now really those adolescents that are growing up in intact families um, where there hasn't been divorce are really the minority as opposed to the other way around. So it's been a big switch for our kids. Um, so there's a lots of step parents and step siblings and parents dating and all of that kind of thing going on. And I would also say that our teenagers have real, our, all of our kids right now are growing up at a time of heightened expectations and it increased stress. Um, you know, there's a lot of expectation, a lot of things that are required of them. They're being asked to do things at younger and younger ages. Um, and the things, the choices and the decisions that they're making and in elementary school and in middle school are now affecting their abilities to, you know, access higher education and where they might go to school. Whereas, you know, it used to be, maybe that was stuff that started when you were in high school, but now it's, you know, what elementary school do you get into and what middle school do you get into and how do you do and what are your grades and all of that kind of stuff. So there's lots and lots and lots of, of differences from when maybe we were kids um, till now. And even some of you who may be on here are on the younger end of the spectrum, um, not like myself, um, even different from you, uh, I would say that access to technology, um, you know, and, and the ability to kind of just have everything at your fingertips. So lots of growth happening in, in our adolescence, lots of things are changing and moving. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So one of the first things to think about is physically what's going on with our kids' bodies. Well, even as I was preparing for this, um, I did some fresh research and realized that the onset of menarche, the, the median age for the onset of, um, of girls getting their period has changed. It's no longer 12 and a half years. It's actually the median age, according to the CDC, is 11 years old. So when we think about that, then we're now looking at and adjusting our numbers. Girls as young as nine and a half can get their periods. And it can also be those up to the age of 17. So we do have those outliers, but the median age, interestingly enough, is 11 years now. Our girls go through a real growth spurt between the ages of 13 and 15, where they can grow between two and a half or two to five inches. And obviously the rest of their body is continuing to develop um, for several years beyond sort of that onset of puberty, which would be around eight or nine years old, menarche, which is around 11, and it'll continue for, for several years beyond, right, up till. And for our boys, what's going on with our boys? Well, 
they have they don't get their growth spurt until between 16 and 19 years old where they can grow between you know two to five inches and for our boys they go through that um and some of you males who are on here may remember you go through that really awkward period where your hands and your feet and your head all reach adult size but your legs and your arms you know um, are, aren't quite there yet. So there's this real awkward, clumsy stage. Um, boys go through the, the changes of their voice. They may experience nocturnal emissions. And I'll never forget going to my, uh, my son's third, or his eighth grade graduations. Remember, they're about 13 years old. Our girls are hitting their growth spurts. So it looked like the boys graduating from eighth grade were graduating from fifth grade. And it looked like the girls graduating from eighth grade were graduating from high school, right? There was such a difference in their development at that age. Um, so much going on. And even within, you know, the same sex. So when I think about my son, when, you know, he was a teenager, um, you know, he was really small for his age. I used to joke with him that he wouldn't be able to get his driver's license because he'd never be big enough to sit in the front seat of the car, never weigh enough in New York State. Um, but, you know, he had a friend who was six foot two, had a size adult 13 shoe. Um, you know, he was a really big kid standing next to my son who was, you know, five foot nothing and weighed almost nothing. And, uh, but my son, was developmentally, intellectually more mature than his other friend. So there's a lot going on with these guys. Just because their bodies may take adult proportion, it doesn't necessarily mean that socially and emotionally are keeping up with the rate of change that's going on in their bodies. So keep that in mind as you're working with our adolescents that we can't just look at them and say, oh, you look like an adult, therefore you think like an adult because that's just not true. Um, lots and lots of other things might be going on. So how are they thinking? What is going on with them? Well, we do know in adolescence, they start getting more self-conscious about themselves. They really look at themselves and everything they say and they play it back time and time again in their heads about what they did. And they're so self-critical and they're so idealistic of everybody around them and critical, critical of the adults in their environment, right? Um, we never experienced what they're experiencing. They are absolutely convinced that the world was vastly different when we were children and we can't possibly understand them and, and everything that's going on in their lives. Um, what else is happening cognitively is they're now capable of things like metacognition. Metacognition is the ability to think about thinking. So what that means is in like say math class, for example, if they're asked to solve an algebra problem or a geometry problem, they don't just solve the problem, but that they're then asked to write a paragraph about how they came to the conclusion or the answer that they came to. So that's really thinking about your thinking and your thought process. So they're able to do that now, which means that they can form hypotheses, they can test them out, they can take on multiple views of the same situation and understand it from different perspectives. So by 14, their brain has the ability to make decisions the same as an adult does. But as we kind of go forward, you'll realize that even though they have the capacity to and sometimes can make very adult decisions. There's a whole lot of other things going on that really um, impedes their ability to kind of think about consequences and kind of think things through. And what are those things that are going on for our teenagers? Well, um, yeah, so why do they make bad decisions? Well, they're impulsive, right? Teens are impulsive. They, they're in the moment, they're moving, they're doing things. Um, they don't think about the consequences of their words or actions. Um, there's a lot of hormones happening. And we used to think, you know, that a lot of what was going on with our teens was hormone related. Those hormones were raging in them. And we all said that. And I know my, my kids, when they would get up in the morning, you know, I, as, as school age and middle schoolers, I'd be like, Hey, how are you? And we'd have a happy morning. And once they hit those teen years, I stopped greeting them with a good morning and instead did some assessment of what their face looked like and how they were moving around the kitchen and what was happening with them before I hazarded a good morning. Because sometimes I would get a, a wonderful good morning from them and other times I would get my head bit off, right? Because those emotions are just all over the place for these kids. And the last thing I want you to really kind of think about is they seek out intense experiences that will thrill, scare, and excite them. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's been some, re some research going on with teens. And one of the things they found is that our teen brain is more sensitive to dopamine. And when we talk about dopamine in the brain, we're talking about sort of 
at its simplest level, that neurotransmitter, that sort of the happy neurotransmitter, right? So it's happy, good feelings, positive feelings. Um, and so the more dopamine we have in our brain, sort of the happier we feel. Well, in our teen years, the dopamine receptors are increasing the amount we have are increasing in our brains. And we're also having an enhanced supply of dopamine available. Um, so our teens can experience rushes um, of dopamine like we'd never experience as adults. So when you think back to your teenage years, and I was laughing I was, as I was you know, preparing, I was thinking, yeah, you know, things never seem as fun now as an adult as they did when I was a teenager. And it's really not because of all the additional things that we have going on in our lives, but it really may be connected to the levels of dopamine that our, our brains are experiencing. And in further research, what they found is that teens actually may have um, baseline levels of dopamine that are lower than adults have. So they're starting at a lower level than we are, and then they're getting these intense surges of dopamine, um, which really can kind of cause more of a, a craving for it and a release of that. So when we do things that thrill and scare and excite us, um, we even get more of that dopamine out there, more of that, that good feeling um, hormone. So they basically have this hopped up reward system that really drowns out warning systems about risk, right? That this might be dangerous. There may be consequences for these behaviors. Um, and it's important to remember this stuff. Um, it's not just about pausing and thinking things through. There's actually some real chemical reactions going on in our teenagers' brains that may be um, leading to some of the behaviors that they're engaging in when we just kind of shake our heads and look at them and be like, like, what were you thinking when you were doing that, right? Um, and the other thing going along with this, this dopamine thing is the prefrontal lobe of our brains, which is really responsible for our planning and our decision making and our goal setting, it's a work in progress. And so for some reason in our teenage years, that's when those please don't enter this area um, because we are under construction signs go up. Um, and so those neural connections that we no longer need anymore are sort of being gone away with and the ones that we're using all the time are being enhanced. Um, so that part of that brain of our brain that really is responsible for putting on our brakes, for controlling our impulsive actions, for controlling our runaway emotions, isn't working at its full capacity at this point in time, right? So it's just not up to full capacity. So it's not available. So we're craving this dopamine. We're, you know, wanting those instant rushes and the part of our brain that's saying this might not be such a good choice isn't fully available to us. So these kind of explain some of our, um, of what's going on with this. And I saw a really great quote um, about this and it says, teenagers bodies are hormone fueled pleasure seeking machines lacking higher brain functions needing to adequately adequately control those urges right so when we think about all the hormones everything that's going on and then the fact that they don't necessarily have those parts of the brain available to them that are saying well hold up maybe not maybe we shouldn't do this so other things to think about um, along with all that and it's going on with our kids is, is their use of language is changing. So a lot of our adolescents are capable of communicating like adults. They can have conversation with us, their vocabulary. Most of our adolescents um, on the developmental spectrum who are where they're supposed to be can communicate like an adult, have good use of words, but they really are not used to face-to-face -face communication, right? So. I, I will sit, again, I use my children a lot as examples, right? You learn from who you live with. Um, they will be, my son will be watching a basketball game with all of his friends and somebody will make a great shot or a great block and they will all yell at the TV at the same moment. And then I turn and look at them and they're all on their phones texting and I start laughing and I'm like, are you guys literally texting each other in the same room about the play you just saw on TV? And they'll be like, well, yeah. So they don't even talk to them, their friends sort of in that face-to-face -face communication as much, right? Um, a lot of their communication is really online through their phones, through the computers, through their Xbox games, yelling into their headsets, all that kind of stuff is going on with them. So we need to think about when we're talking to both our impacted children and our exhibit 
exhibiting children, that having those conversations with us may be awkward and difficult for them, not only because of subject matter, not only because we're adults, but because we're also asking them to do it in a face-to-face -face manner with us. Um, the other thing is that our teens want to be perceived as knowing everything. They don't want to say, I don't get it, I don't understand. So they won't ask us for clarification if they don't understand what we're saying. They still struggle with things like long, complex sentences when we use double negatives in our sentences. Um, so we need to really kind of make sure that we're using simplistic language when we're asking questions of our kids and when we're talking to our kids, particularly those youth and adolescents that you don't know very well um, until you kind of get a better handle on sort of where their language is at. And the, the slang that our adolescents use and what their words mean now, I don't know about you guys, but I could use almost a whole foreign language um, lesson on that. Uh, so don't be afraid if you don't understand what, what teens are saying and how they're using words um, to have them explain that to you. And don't assume that the way that you're, they're using a slang word is the way that you used it as a youth because it can be completely different. The other thing to think about is that our teenagers, while the majority of them won't come out and tell us an out and out lie, a lot of times it is almost seems like second nature for them to lie to us by omission. So an example of this, one of the things that I can think about, you know, in this way is, is you find out that an adolescent has gone to a party and you say to the adolescent, were you drinking at the party? And they say, absolutely not. And they can completely assure you, making eye contact, that they were not drinking at that party. And then you listen to more and ask more information about the party and you find out that the adolescent was doing jello shots. So they weren't drinking alcohol at the party, they were eating alcohol at the party. See the little bit of a difference there? That's that lie by omission. So we really have to think about when we're talking to our teens, how we're asking for information, what kind of information we're asking for, and making sure even in our questioning that we're not giving them an automatic out to, to omit certain bits of information. Um, so just kind of keep that stuff in, in mind when we're talking to our teenagers and what's going on with them. Socially and emotionally, again, a, a tough period of time for our kids. Um, Erickson um, coined the phrase identity versus role confusion, right? So what they're really trying to do is figure out who they are. And what they have are they have all these different roles that they've played in all these different spheres in their lives. They may be the oldest child in the family and they may have siblings and they may be a student and they may be a friend or a basketball player or into theater or they play chess, right? All these different things that are going on with them and they're trying to integrate all those different roles and all those different interests and all the different things that are going on with them into an idea of who they are as a person. Um, and a lot of times they, they are, they can act as if they're a child in an adult body. So sometimes, you know, we have this teen who's acting so independent and so mature one minute. And the next thing you know, you know, they're, they're six foot tall and they're trying to sit down on your lap and, and they want to kind of be babied or treated as much younger than they are. They're still trying to get all of that figured out. Um, and so when you think about all of these roles and kind of rolling all these roles in, particularly in the military, I've had a lot of friends who grew up in military and they said, you know, every time we moved, every time we were moved to a different base or we changed location, I had the opportunity to reinvent myself. So if we're trying to figure out who we are and then we also have this um, added option of being able to reinvent themselves into who they wanna be or how they wanna present themselves at their next location, um, you know, because of the, the more moves that a, a military um, adolescent might face than others, um, how much can that kind of complicate this process for our kids and helping them synthesize into one person who they might be? So all that is important. And most of my friends who grew up in the military said they loved the ability to kind of do fresh starts and start overs, right? Those things that haunted you in kindergarten when you got sick and threw up on the teacher didn't stay with you if you were able to move around more frequently, um, as opposed to those who may live in one location their entire lives. Again, kind of back to um, talking a little bit about some of the risk taking um, that our adolescents are doing. You know, 
these um, might not might mean those risks that we previously had talked about. Um, and it may be, you know, them looking for those extreme sort of highs as a result of taking risks or doing kind of things, um, you know, that that have risk associated with them or consequences associated with them. I often think that that time of adolescence that Erickson talks about is not all that different than the time that he also talks about in the development for um, toddlers, right? So if you think about a toddler and the risks that they might take, you know, they're getting up on their feet and they're starting to walk and they may risk falling down or they miss, may risk bumping their head. And then when they first start walking, they'll frequently look back at the parent or the caregiver to make sure that they're still there for a sense of safety and a sense of security. Um, so they're taking risks, <clears throat> excuse me, in their development. Um, and, and our adolescents are really kind of paralleling that at, at just a later age and stage in their development. Unfortunately, when they're taking risks, they can be taking risks around things like alcohol and cars and sex and drugs. And those things can have much more serious and much more long-term consequences than you know, for the toddler who's, who's walking away. Um, so all of those kinds of things are, are important to kind of keep in mind when we're talking about risk taking with our kids. And relationally, what's going on with our kids. So take a second here, everybody, and just think about your first love. Anybody remember your first love, that first person, the first time you felt like you were in love? And we all want to just sigh and it's kind of a happy feeling for most people, right? And kind of thinking about that. I have a, a really good friend who talks about her first love and, and she says, oh, oh, he was everything to me. I mean, we, we could be together all day in school and, you know, after school, we, as soon as we got home, we were on the phone and we could talk for hours and we would just sit on the phone sometimes and there would be just complete silence between us, but that was okay because we were together. And she's like, you know, I was absolutely in love with him. And if he had asked me to move into a shack in the woods with him, I would have done it in a heartbeat. And now she laughs and she says, so I looked him up because we could do that now with online. She goes, and ironically, he kind of does live in a shack in the woods and she actually did quite well for herself. So, you know, those first relationships, they mean so much to us and they're so important to us and, and, and our development. Um, we're pretty idealistic about them, right? Um, you know, this is our forever thing. I remember when my son and his girlfriend, his first girlfriend broke up having that conversation with them that there's a reason they're called your first girlfriend or your first boyfriend or your first partner as opposed to your forever, right? Um, it's a very rare occasion where someone's first love is also the person that they stay with for their whole life. Um, so they feel very misunderstood when it comes to their relationships. We don't get it. We don't understand. We've never felt love like they feel. We've never had a relationship like they're having. All of those things just seem so critical to them. Um, this is when we talk about, and you all mentioned your peers being important to you, your friends being so important to you, fitting in, finding a group we belong to, all of that is critical to our development. And as important as our friends are and as much of an influence as our friends have on us, it's still important to know that family, caregivers, parents still have the strongest influence on those large scale decisions that our kids might make. Decisions like whether or not they go to college, when they engage in sex for the first time, um, information around substance use. A lot of times parents have a, have a larger influence than peers do on those big, big decisions. Our teens are also developing, um, children are developing along a moral scale. So Kohlberg, for any of you who've taken child development, Erickson, Kohlberg, these will be familiar names with you. But Kohlberg talks about levels of moral development. It's important to know that not everybody progresses through all three levels of moral development and that some adults are still functioning in the stage one or stage two level of moral development. Um, that sort of pre-morality where our morality is sort of comes from the outside as opposed to from inside of us. So the first stage is kind of avoiding punishment, right? We do what we're supposed to do because we don't wanna get in trouble. And then that second stage is is we do what we're supposed to do because there might be some reward for it, even if that reward is someone saying, hey, good job or good choice or 
something like that. That's still a reward. That's still a personal gain. Um, and then there's the level two, which is more of that conventional morality. And this really is where most adults stop their development. And I, I like to think of stage three, that interpersonal concordance orientation, right? Um, doing sort of group the, the majority rules here. And I think of this more as the playground or um, um, morality. So if you think about a bunch of kids on a playground playing a game of kickball or tag or whatever, um, whatever the group says the rules are, are what the rules are. So that group mentality sort of wins. And then stage four is that law and order orientation. So you do what you're supposed to do because that's what the rules are. That's what society says you should do. That's what the law says you should do. And, and this again is really where most adults stop development. But there's also a level three, which is more of that post-conventional morality. And stage five is doing what you think is right, even if it's against the law. Um, because you believe that the law is too restrictive. And you know, there's, there's lots of examples that could be used um, in, in this arena. Uh, for a long time, there were folks who would grow and engage in the use of marijuana because they thought the laws around marijuana use were too restrictive. And now we see states actually changing those laws, right? So um, thinking about those folks who would operate outside of what the law said because they had their own beliefs about it. And then stage six is sort of doing what is right because that's just what your conscience sort of tells you should do, the sacredness of life, kind of the importance of, of being and doing, um, you know, things that, that are, are important and right for you. Um, and and they're, they're good positive choices. These are important when we think about our adolescents because we sort of wanna know where they're falling on this level of moral, moral development and morality because when we're working with them in any capacity, we always wanna encourage them to be moving toward that next stage of development, thinking ahead of that to that next stage, giving them opportunity to sort of grow in their moral capacity and their moral development. So th these things are kind of impo important for our kids. And then the big thing, right? The sexual development. And this is beyond the physical development. This is when we're talking about sexuality itself, um, not just the body changing, but sort of how they feel about their bodies changing and sort of what's going on with them. Um, there could be a lot of ambivalence and discomfort around bodies developing, right? So those um, adolescents who develop early and those adolescents who develop later and get those secondary sexual characteristics, et cetera, um, it's, it's a harder struggle for them because remember in our teenage years, we really, for the majority of us want to be just like everybody else. And this is something that's happening that's setting us apart or making us different. So those teens that sort of develop somewhere in that middle time period are usually the ones that have an easier time with this than those on either end of the spectrum. Um, the other thing that's going on with sexual development is, um, you know, masturbation is, is a normal um, part of, of life for our children. Lots of children touch their private parts um, and we should, you know, be instructing them and talking to them about the rules around doing that, that it's something that's done in private, right? That they don't take too much time, et cetera. But in teenage, and it's done for comfort. It's, it's sort of a comforting thing. It sort of might be like a child will rub on a blanket or have a certain pillow or stuffy that they like to sleep in. It, it's a comforting behavior type thing. And then in our teenage years, masturbation becomes more goal-directed and it becomes goal-directed toward orgasm. So it's no longer done because it's sort of a self-soothing behavior. It's done in order to achieve an orgasm. So there is that change that happens in adolescence. Um, our teenagers are able to engage in a whole range of behaviors at this point, right? A whole range of sexual behaviors and a whole bunch of experimentation that's going on for them. Um, and, you know, and, and, and they have all these thoughts and all these feelings and all these urges going on in their bodies and, and they're responding to those and they're trying to figure them out and they're trying to make sense of them. Um, they're, they're looking at things like, what is my or orientation? What is my identity? Who am I attracted to? All of those kinds of things are happening um, for our adolescents. And, and in this time in our society, there, there is so much more of an openness to um, being able to look at things along a spectrum and being more open about how, how 
they're feeling and, and sort of what's going on with them um, for most of our adolescents, not for, for all of them. So um, we need to kind of be aware of, of what's going on and, and what's happening. Um, so teens and sex, what is normal? Um, there's so many, uh, <laughs> that, that's such a loaded question, right? What's normal? Um, it's a spectrum of behaviors. Um, but I also want to let you know that there are other um, trainings that are on your handouts um, that are available to you that you can also um, kind of look to and, 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 uh, and view around teens and sex and sort of what's normal behavior, et cetera. Um, I have another polling question for you. Don't worry, it's not about your own sexual activity. It's about teenagers. Do you believe that one, most teenagers are sexually active. The vast majority of them are sexually active. Do you believe that most teens say that they're more sexually active than they really are? Or do you really have no idea sort of what's going on with our teenagers at this point? If you could respond to that poll. Oh, about a quarter of you think teens are, the vast majority of teens are sexually active. A good two thirds of you are saying, most teens say they're sexually active, maybe more sexually active than they really are. And, and about 10% of you are like, throw your hands up in the air. I, I have no idea anymore. I don't know what's going on. Um, the most recent data I could find on this was the CDC in 2017. Um, they said that females between the ages of 15 and to 19, about 42% of them are reporting that they are sexually active. Um, and males, about 44% are reporting that they are sexually active. So not even half, right? Not even 50%. Um, these numbers, interestingly, are lower than the numbers that were recorded in 1988. In 1988, 51% of the females were sexually active and reporting they were sexually active, and 60% of the males were reporting that they were sexually active. So we actually have seen a decrease <clears throat> in the overall um, number of teenagers who are sexually active. Um, so it just kind of important to kind of keep in mind, right? Um, and, and some of the assumptions that we might make about our teens as, as we're working with them. So what is normal for these guys? Well, who knows? It's a whole spectrum, right? It's a whole spectrum of, of behaviors for our teens. They can range from being very, very naive about sexual behaviors and sexual activity and relationships to being highly sexualized, right? And, and to being um, very sexually active. Um, we do know, and I know these, this kind of flies in the face of what I just said, um, for those who are sexually active, some of them are reporting that they are having intercourse at an earlier age than in previous generations, but there are fewer overall who are sexually active. So if that helps that statistic make any sense. Um, our girls are catching up to our boys in the areas of sexual assertiveness. Girls are feeling as if they can be more sexually assertive, can be more sexually aware, can be more sexually involved um, and not feeling some of those double um, you know, the stereotypes that, that were out there about, you know, girls weren't supposed to um, talk about sex or be sexual, but boys were supposed to, which kind of made you wonder who the boys were supposed to be being sexual with if it wasn't the girls, but that's a whole other question for a different time. Um, so we also need to know that there's so much more information available to our kids out there. Um, there's so much going on with them. And so we want to, uh, to be aware of where they're getting this information from um, and know that all, all those myths that you might've grown up, they're still out there, right? That you can't get pregnant the first time you have sex. Kids are still hearing those very same things. Um, we also know that kids who talk to their parents about sex and sexuality, they actually um, are, it, are later initiators into the sexual arena. So um, everyone's learning in a different rate, different place, lots of things going on differently. Um, the social media technology has a whole lot of influence on our sexual behaviors. There's some really good webinars out there, some really good studies out there. Um, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this for you with you guys, but um, just know that this increased access to technology um, 
is if you think about the time of COVID, right? Um, we've been giving our kids computers and sending them into their bedroom and having them shut doors because we're working and they're in school and their siblings in school and we can't all be listening to everything that everybody else is saying because it's too hard to work. So um, we know that we're putting our kids more online. So we may very well be seeing uh, that there may be more of an issue sort of down the road post COVID of kids being actualizing um, or, or seeing sexualized media like pornography or engaging in digital behaviors. Um, so lots of things uh, can, be, can be going on with these kids. Um, also that rate, the rates of children sexting are not as high as we really think that they are. And just be aware of what your community feels about um, youth uh, child pornography versus youth produced images or youth um, initiated images or sexual images. There's a lots of change and lots going on. These are a few webinars that are available to you. Um, and again, you have a handout that talks about these guys and their availability. Um, a little bit about teen exposure to pornography. 90% um, of boys and 60% of girls are exposed to pornography before the age of 18. Um, and that about 50% of boys and 33% of girls are exposed even before the age of 13. Almost a third of our teens are exposed to pornography before the age of 10. There's an interesting video down here for you to watch. Um, you may find it interesting. It may be helpful in working with um, parents kind of going forward. I just found this stat really, really interesting. Uh, if you look at the dates below, this is in 2020. So you remember when um, social distancing, quarantining, social isolating started happening around early March, early to mid-March of 2020. If you look at the increase in the use of Pornhub, um, which is a free access to pornography um, use, in the US and then also in the world traffic, uh, those numbers are just astronomical, right? Uh, look how much they jumped um, and then COVID went on and that quarantining went on for a long period of time. So lots going on there. I love this quote. Um, kids are learning about pornography or kids are learning about sex from porn stars. Imagine if I left my kids to learn about drugs from drug dealers. And that's a quote from Erica Lust who is a porn producer. Um, and these, these porn producer, uh, what, what she's saying is, you know, in our schools, we have programs around drugs and we recognize the danger of drugs to our teens and to our, our children. And we talk to them about it. We have a lot of education around it. Um, and, and we should, and all of that is really, really important, but we don't do the same thing around pornography. Um, we're hesitant to have these conversations with our kids or to discuss anything sexual with them, let alone talking to them about pornography. And on some level, we sort of passively normalize that, um, oh yeah, kids watch this, that's okay. Um, but if you have not um, kind of looked into this in, in some time, pornography these days is vastly different than pornography was um, you know, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we had movies with scripts and uh, producers, et cetera, et cetera. Now and today, um, a lot of times these are sort of like GoPro cameras and amateurs filming and videoing. And um, there's a whole lot of more information out there. And uh, it's in, and there's a lot more violence in pornography, et cetera. So there's a whole lot going on um, that, that parents aren't aware of when they may be thinking about, well, you know, I looked at it, it's okay if my kid looks at it, but what their kids are seeing is really different. So we have to do some education for both our parents and for our kids um, because pornography is having a real influence on the sexuality of our kids. Again, there's some really good webinars and some good information on sexting and adolescents out there. Um, you know, 22% of teen girls and 18% of teen boys um, report sending or posting nude or semi-nude photos. Um, more than half the girls say it's pressure from a guy and 18% of the guys say it's pressure from a girl. And if we look at this realistically, the reality is it's not just our teens. If there are any of you who are single adults who are dating, you know that this is also happening in the adult arena, right? That 
folks are sending pictures and folks are requesting pictures and videos, et cetera. Um, so it's not just our teens. And so we can't chalk this up to poor decision-making in adolescence. Um, it really has some link to the media and what's available to us now and, and sort of what people are doing. Um, so we need to be aware of that when we're working with our teens and, and talk to them a little bit about the consequences. So what is this? Adolescence is the perfect storm, right? It's the perfect storm for, for maybe potentially engaging in problematic sexual behavior. It's a time of significant growth in our development, both sexually and physically. That area of our brain that's supposed to kind of help us make those good choices isn't working the way it's supposed to be working. Our moral compass isn't quite really where it should be, right? Um, we're still developing, we're still learning, we're still experiencing. Our peers are so important with us, but there's such uncertainty and such a need to fit in and be like and, and be able to engage in those conversations that our peers are doing. We have so much access to technology and so much access to pornography um, and, and separating from our parents and trying to be not like them is a real important part of what's happening with us. So it's sort of this perfect storm of things that might be going on with, with our teenagers and what might be happening. Um, and so, you know, it, it's no wonder they're making poor choices and we're seeing problematic and illegal behaviors, but all is not lost. Please, there is hope. There are a lot of really good supportive factors that are also happening in our adolescents' lives. And I just want to take a minute to talk about each of these because this is really important when we're, when we're assessing kids to think about and look at. These are their strengths. These are maybe some of the areas that they're bringing to the table that we could build upon. And these are also things that we can be teaching and working on in treatment with kids to help them to make better choices and, and to avoid sort of some of the, the risk potential behaviors that are out there. Um, having healthy boundaries and having adults that support and model healthy boundaries around relationships, et cetera, is really, really important. Having adults in their lives that will protect them from harm and from trauma um, is real, real important for our kids. Having adults that provide good guidance and good supervision. Um, so there's rules and there's consequences for those rules and adults know where those kids are and what they're doing. All that is a protective factor for our kids. Um, when our youth are able to have good, healthy friendships. So, you know, setting up situations, helping them to, to form good, healthy relationships, getting them involved in activities where they can be around peers and experience successful friendships is a, is a protective factor for our kids. When our kids have open communication and they can communicate about feelings with a trusted adult, and that adult doesn't necessarily have to be a caregiver. One of my um, really good friends is a coach, and he says a lot of the youth that he coaches um, will come to him and, and, and talk to him about sort of what's going on in their lives. And he's always clear to say, like, you know, have you talked to your parents about this and make sure that parents are hearing it? But knowing that you have an adult you can go to that you can talk about what's happening is, is really, really helpful. Um, helping our kids have good, successful experiences in their lives, um, helping them to find things that they excel at, that they're talented at, helping them explore their talents um, and enhance those skills and give them opportunities to enhance and build them are good protective factors for our youth against problematic sexual behaviors. And, and also, um, looking at adaptive coping skills. And I think that this is where a lot of our youth are really struggling now. Um, that delay of gratification is a coping skill, but we don't have a whole lot of delay of gratification in our world today. If I want something online, there are many places I can, I can if I want something, I can order it online and I can have it delivered to my house by tonight. Um, no longer is it the day where you had to wait to get to the store and then order it and then it took weeks to show up and then you had to go and pick it up, right? It's available. If I want a book, I don't have to wait for it to come back into the library for those 25 other people ahead of me to finish reading it. I can just purchase it online and I can have it in my hands within seconds, right? So a lot of that coping skill, that, that delay of gratification isn't there. And also um, not being not being the winner, not being successful. Also, um, you know, when kids join up for sports now, almost everybody who engages in that sport or that activity gets a trophy for having participated. Um, and it used to be it was just those kids or just those youth who were the winning team or the top two teams and the others had to sort of deal with 
the you know the disillusion or or the disappointment that they didn't get a trophy um, so we don't have a lot of those sort of skills to be able to do that so we really need to think about how we're teaching our teenagers and how we're teaching our kids those coping skills um, and and those things are good supportive protective factors for our kids and kids to, things to keep in mind so those are things that we can build on and enhance with the youth and families that we're working on working with all right, I'm going to pause here for a minute and see if anybody has any questions. Thanks, Renee. We haven't had, we've had some resource sharing. Thank you so much for that in the um, chat, but we haven't had any questions. So to be mindful of time, I think you can continue on um, with your presentation. And if we do have some time at the end, we'll definitely try to get to any questions that come up um, while you finish out your presentation. Great, Kaylin. Thank you so much. All right, so let's talk a little bit now that we've talked about sort of that normal development type stuff. Let's talk a little bit more about problematic sexual behavior in adolescence and what's going on with these kids. Well, there are certain things that may make adolescents more vulnerable to engaging in problematic sexual behavior. And, and what are some of those things that, that we can talk about? Well, some of them are the child's own personal vulnerabilities, things about that child. So it could be the child who has behavior problems, kids with development mental or verbal delays, kids with impulse control problems. And in no way am I saying all kids with developmental disabilities or verbal disabilities or learning disabilities engage in problematic sexual behavior, but it may be something that makes them more susceptible to it, right? Um, we also talk about things around family adversity. So when there's factors that kind of in inhibit our parents' abilities to provide good guidance and good supervision, and that may very well be that single parent that's working two or three jobs to support their family or support their children, um, you know, aren't home, aren't available to provide the level of oversight because they're trying to keep a roof over the head. So not cast any sort of shame or blame in any way, but just saying that those are things to kind of keep in mind. Parents with um, their own mental health issues, parents with substance abuse issues, those kinds of things can be factors that may in hinder, hinder a parent's ability to provide good guidance and good supervision to our kids. Um, another thing is sort of our youth or, uh, where coercion is modeled for them. And when I worked with the adolescents, this is what I saw a lot, and this is what we see a lot showing up in research, is those adolescents that um, are witnessing domestic violence, community violence, um, you know, peer violence, bullying, those kinds of things, physical abuse within the home, harsh parenting practices, any of those things that sort of say, you know, might makes right, like the stronger win, or you can force others to sort of comply with the stronger person, et cetera. So that modeling of coercion is important to keep in mind. And then finally, the modeling of sexuality. And um, there's, you know, there's a fallacy out there that kids who engage in problematic or illegal sexual behaviors do so because they were victims themselves. Yes, there are a number of youth where that is true, but it's not as high of a number as you think it is. And the older a child gets, when they engage in their uh, first problematic or illegal sexual behavior, the less likely it is that it's a result of their own potential victimization. However, their own victimization, um, particularly if there was penetration or if a youth ex experienced multiple perpetrators of sexual abuse, um, those factors can contribute to problematic sexual behavior. But there's also, um, modeling and exposure to sexuality within the home. So adults who are sexual with each other in front of their children, older siblings who are sexual, et cetera, and exposure to pornography, all of those factors can contribute to youth engaging in problematic sexual behaviors. So important for us to kind of keep in mind. So what about our teens who engage? Let's, let's figure out a little bit about them. How much experience do you guys have in working with adolescents with problematic sexual behaviors? Um, and again, if you could just kind of respond to this poll. All right. So what we're seeing is zero to two years, about 50% of you are saying I have less than two years experience. About a quarter of you have three to five years experience and then the rest of you six years to about 11 plus. So there's a range here, but less experience. Um, and 
that's you know not surprising. Um, there's not a lot of folks that have had specialized training in working with adolescents with problematic sexual behaviors. And those who have, some of them have had actual training and some of them have just had to learn, teach themselves, find materials available to them because those kids are showing up and, and what else and who else is gonna work with them, right? Um, but do know that there's some really good training out there and some good studies about the outcomes of that training that we're gonna talk about. How confident, and just kind of throw this number in the, in the chat box for me, how confident do you feel in navigating work with adolescents from, with problematic sexual behaviors, with one being not at all, and 10 being, I have got this, I know exactly what I'm doing, right? Throw some numbers out there about how you feel, your comfort level in working with these kids. Yeah, and you know, we're seeing a real, eight, real range. I'm seeing, you know, ones to eights. Eights about the highest I've seen so far, right? Oh, there's a 10. Yeah, you would. <laughs> I see you, Sharice. Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, and, and just kind of keep that comfort level in mind. Um, and, and what can you do to kind of increase your comfort level? And I hope attending, you know, this training and other trainings that are made available to you will sort of help you with, with increasing your comfort level and working with these adolescents. Um, what do we know about adolescents who do have problematic or illegal sexual behaviors? Well, we know that they're a very diverse population. There's no single set of characteristics about uh, out there. Um, we know that males and females engage in problematic sexual behavior. Um, we know that the diversity goes to um, their race, their family factors, their socioeconomic status, their abuse histories, any history of psychological problems. We know the average age is, is, is approximately 14. And there's you know, been some studies that say um, early adolescents that, that 13, 14 year range, right, is when adolescents are at the highest risk to engage in problematic sexual behavior. And then it's sort of as they get older, it, it, it tends to taper off. Um, so it's, it's important to, to kind of keep that in mind. And if you think back on everything that we talked about, about what's been going on with um, our, our adolescents, um, if you think about all the things that are happening with them developmentally, it makes sense, right, that this might be that peak time when everything is changing for them developmentally and what's going on. Um, yes, there is a difference between problematic and illegal sexual behaviors. And illegal sexual behavior would be something that's actually um, the adolescent could be charged with. It, it's against the law. It is a crime, as opposed to um, kids who may engage in a problematic behavior. Um, there may be, you know, statutorily, they're, they're not able to be charged for that crime. So there is there can be some differences. We think more about, you know, um, also problematic behaviors may be behaviors that are committed um, you know, around maybe um, a youth who is 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 masturbating or looking at a lot of pornography, um, while they may not be charged for looking at adult pornography, it may be interfering, it may be problematic, it's causing a problem within their lives, but it's not necessarily any legal behavior. So thank you for that question. Some of the statistics that we find, so if you think of all adults who are charged with crimes, um, Teenage, teens, adolescents are 26% of those um, individuals have engaged in sex offenses, right? Um, and 36% of all who have been charged with a sex crime, 36% of them, percent of them are individuals who have engaged in sex offenses against a, who have a juvenile who's the impacted um, person, right? And then when we think of just juveniles charged with sexual offenses, um, Problematic sexual behavior, illegal sexual behavior accounts for 3% of all juvenile offenses. It accounts for 7% of all violent juvenile offenses. Um, and about 38% of those juvenile offenses occur with children between the ages of 12 to 14 are, are, are being perpetrated by those kids 12 to 14 years old. Um, some other characteristics of these kids. What we know um, and what these slides are basically saying to us is that um, adolescents who engage in problematic sexual behavior are not the same as adults who engage in sexual offending behaviors. There's big differences between them. Um, and and these, these slides um, and studies will highlight some of those differences for them, right? 
Um, we do know that the vast majority of adolescents are more likely to have a male victim than a female victim, and they're more likely to have a victim under the age of 12. Um, for ages 15 to 17, the mean age of victims is 11 to 13, and those over 17 tend to engage um, in problematic sexual behavior more with peers. What about boys who engage in problematic sexual behavior? Uh, well, they have different motivations for their behaviors. A lot more of our adolescents who engage in problematic sexual behavior are motivated by experimentation or curiosity. Um, it's not that they are um, attracted to children. Um, the vast majority of them, it's, it's around trying to figure it out and, and impulsive behaviors and not thinking things through. Um, they don't engage in those things that we typically think of with adult offenders around the, the um, sort of the dynamics of sexual abuse, sort of that grooming behavior, those cycles, those kinds of things that we see with adults. Uh, we're not seeing that with, with our adolescents, all right? Um, and then also, again, again some other things. Uh, this, this study sort of review things that we've previously talked about, right? Um, that some may have a history of sexual, uh, sexual abuse history, um, that it may be exposure to violence. A lot of them have exposure to violence within their histories, a sense of so social isolation, poor, low self-esteem, anxiety disorder, et cetera, exposure to sex, exposure to pornography. It's really those risk factors that we talked about earlier when we were talking about those four areas of risk. And what about our females? Um, well known, about 7% of all adolescents with problems, problematic sexual behavior are females. Um, they're a diverse population. The average age is 14 years old. They commonly know the person um, who is impacted by their behaviors. Um, but again, bear in mind, we may not know the majority, how many adolescents are actually engaging in these behaviors. It just is an unknown for us, right? Their typical sexual behavior is non-aggressive, committed during caregiving activities such as babysitting, et cetera. Um, so lots of different kinds of statistics around, around girls, um, more likely to have multiple victims, more likely to, again to have male victims, et cetera. Um, we also know that females typically have more of a possibility of having had their own history of sexual abuse and physical abuse than the male counterparts um, and may have been victimized at younger ages or had multiple perpetrators um, and they may also have more diagnosed psychological problems. And again, these studies are available to you in the interest of time. I'm kind of not read through them and, and kind of talk through all of these, um, but there's lots of kinds of things to kind of bear in mind as, as, we're, as we're looking at them. Um, one of the things to think about are, are there are situational or transitory factors that affect our adolescents. These are things that are gonna change for these kids and in their lives, right? So some of those things that may be going on with our kids is that they don't understand society's rules or the laws around sexual behavior. Um, let me ask all of you, um, how many of you know what the age of consent is? How many of you are aware of what the age of consent is in your state? Um, in looking it up, most US states, the age of consent ranges between 16 and 18. Um, and in the world, the age of consent um, can vary from the age of 11 to the age of 21, depending on where you are. Um, and there are also some countries within the world where there is no age of consent. Can, consent is only given um, by marriage. So unless you're married, it's illegal to engage in sexual behavior. And even within the fact saying that there are, you know, 16 to 18 is the age of consent, there are so many variables in how those laws are interpreted and how they work. I see somebody wrote the Romeo, Romeo clause. Yeah, you know, that is, you know, can within a certain age range, can kids engage in sexual activity with each other and have it not be illegal? So if it's hard enough for us as adults to get our heads around this, imagine what it is for kids who don't even necessarily maybe know that there's rules out there um, around, around when it's okay and when you're legally able to consent to a sexual activity. 
um, not understanding the wrongfulness of the behaviors that they may be engaging in activity, right? Um, so all those kinds of things can, can lead to those are transitory factors, being around negative peers, um, engaging in substance use and abuse, accessing the social media, pornography, et cetera. Um, just know for some of our teens, problematic sexual behavior is, is related to other disruptive behaviors, um, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, et cetera. It's, it's just part of that larger pattern of violating laws and rights of others. Um, then again, that, that you know, there's, there's things that may cause these adolescents to engage in these behaviors. Um, and they may justify their behaviors through sort of antisocial activity, ideas, attitudes, et cetera. Um, and it's really important to think about uh, treatment for these kids because we're not just treating the problematic sexual behavior. We need to be thinking about this larger process of what's going on with them if they're engaging in other de delinquent and disruptive behaviors. And again, studies um, for you all that are here for your availability. When we think about problematic sexual behavior related to intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, also think about the fact that these are particularly, uh, most people with intellectual disabilities or learning disabilities or developmental disabilities do not engage in problematic sexual behavior. So let's just put that rumor to bed, right? Um, but also think about our reluctance potentially engage in um, regular knowledge um, and providing good information on sex and sexuality to some folks with, with disabilities. Um, and they don't, but their bodies are still feeling all those same feelings that we were talking about earlier. They're going through all those same physical changes. And so they, they may not be as apt to learn about the rules or the laws around sexual behavior. So we need to be mindful of that and we need to account for that. And there is treatment available for those, you know, for youth who maybe have learning disabilities or intellectual or developmental disabilities. And sometimes we just need to tailor the program and the work that we are doing to those youth. Um, it's very, very rare that we see adolescents um, who are engaging in problematic sexual behavior because of atypical sexual interest, right? That, that maybe this is the adolescent that is sexually attracted to children. Um, I, the numbers are so very, very small and so very, very rare um, that most of you will never encounter um, that, that that youth and that child, but some of you may, because yes, it certainly is out there. And we do know that from taking some histories from adult offenders that their behavior and interest started um, earlier on in their lives, maybe when they were children or when they were adolescents. Um, all right, so that, those are some thoughts on, on our adolescents. Um, I'm gonna kind of keep moving forward. So we maybe have some time at the end for any kind of questions that are out there. I do have another poll for you all that I want you to look at. Um, once an adolescent's engaged in problematic sexual behavior, what percent do you think will go on to do it again without treatment? What percent of adolescents are gonna go on to engage in problematic sexual behavior if they get no treatment for it? And while you're responding to that poll, I'll tell you that um, with adults, um, with treatment, 27.9% of adults will go on to engage in the behavior again. And with left untreated, adults who've engaged in, in um, sexual offending behaviors, 392 will go on. So we have some who think that between 85 and 100%, right? So I saw a whole range um, of, of responses up there of what folks think the recidivism rate is. So some of these statistics may just surprise you a little bit. Um, looked at um, risk and prognosis around recidivism rate for problematic sexual behavior as well as um, other non-sexual related offenses. And you'll see that the rate for um, recidivism for sexual offenses is, is much lower than other and then those non-sexual recidivism rates, right? Over, um, and this is looking at over 20 plus studies out there. Um, Oklahoma University has done some of their own on their PSBA program, their Problematic Sexual Behavior for Adolescents Treatment Program. And over 10 years, they followed 220 boys from the program. 
Um, and those boys who successfully completed treatment, less than 3% of them went on to engage in another problematic sexual behavior. So that's, that's a great number, right? Less than 3% go on to engage in problematic sexual behavior when they successfully complete treatment. Um, and it might shock you that um, for those without treatment, it's actually under 15%. Because remember, a lot of the factors that uh, lead to our adolescents engaging in these behaviors are transitory factors, factors that are going to change for them. Um, so also, when, and this, this slide sort of shows the same thing thing. We also looked at those boys that successfully completed treatment and engaged in non-sexual um, behavior, behaviors or, or things going on, right, uh, uh, conviction rates um, as adults. And what we know is that completion of treatment, um, those who successfully complete treatment um, about, are about half as likely to actually engage in any non-sexual offenses as well. So that's great information. That's great to, to keep in mind. So not only going through treatment program does it help them to not engage in problematic sexual behavior, but it helps them to avoid criminal activity um, overall, right? And the strongest predictors of those who are gonna be successful in completing treatment is having their parents involved. And the strongest predictors of those who may go on to engage in another problematic sexual behavior is the lower level of caretaker involvement in their treatment, and also those who, who started treatment and had already had previous arrests for other behaviors. Um, so those things are important. We look at risk factors for these behaviors. There's a couple different factors that we look at. We look at our static risks, which are those things that can't be changed. That's historical. Those are markers that those things can't be changed. And then we have dynamic risk factors, which are those factors that are amenable to change. This is where we're focusing our treatment. We're focusing our treatment on these dynamic risk factors. People will ask you if you're working with these youth to engage in risk assessments for our adolescents. Um, and what we need to know is that it's very, very hard to do risk assessments for adolescents, first of all, because there's such a low rate of adolescents who actually do go on to engage in um, you know, other behaviors after having been caught. Um, and that adolescence is a time of change. And so that change itself is going to change that risk over time. So we can't give them a risk assessment and say, this is their risk to reoffend. In fact, the reality is, is that there's not a single instrument out there that has an acceptable validity and reliability to ac accurately predict the level of risk for our juvenile um, in regards to sexual offenses. And our courts aren't aware of this, so they're going to ask us for these numbers. They're going to ask us to, um, to predict these this, right? And, and it's just something that we really can't do. Um, there are some good instruments out there that help us decide where to focus our treatment, and that, that's important for us as, as we go forward. So what do we do with these kids who have engaged in problematic sexual behaviors? Where can we safely manage them? Um, do you think they need to be removed from the community to ensure safety for all? Some of you can throw your responses to that in the chat box. Um, do you think that we need to remove them from our community? Um, and, you know, historically, we have, we have placed adolescents who have engaged in, in behaviors because that's the best way we can assure safety of everybody, right? Um, there's a whole range of possibilities. So outpatient treatment is the lowest level of care. Those community-based programs is our lowest level of care. And then they can go up to and include foster homes and unlocked, you know, staff secure community facilities, secure facilities, locked facilities. Um, and as we go up this pyramid of we know that the cost increases. And the reality is, is keeping one or two of them out of this higher level of care can fund an entire community-based program. So that's just kind of critical to keep in mind. And when we look at research on um, recidivism, we know the vast majority of youth and adolescents between 87 and 100% of them can be successfully um, treated within community-based programs. Um, they can stay safely within the community. So how do we decide if this is a youth who can stay safely within the community? Well, 
um, we do it on a case by case decision. We can't just make a statement that says these kids or this age kid or whomever. We really need to look at each family individually to make those decisions. We need to look at what was the problematic sexual behavior. Is this youth engaging in other problems um, within the home or within the community that are hard to manage or are not being able to be managed? Um, is the youth who is impacted in the home or are there no potential um, you know, victims within that home? And then if the youth is in the home, are there clear safety measures in place? And do the adults who are involved with that youth and do that, does that impacted child themselves feel safe with that adolescent being in the home? Um, those are all really important things for us to kind of keep in mind when we're making these decisions. And finally, and, and, and really importantly is, can the family provide appropriate supervision to these kids? Do they understand the gravity of what that means? When we're setting up safety plans, do they understand what we mean when we say things like eyesight supervision and what that's gonna mean for their lives and how that's gonna impact their lives? Do they believe the behavior happened and so they're willing to follow and comply with those safety plans. Sometimes our kids could stay um, in the community, but they can't stay in the home, right? So who do these kids, they can be placed with other family members. We see a lot of our youth who are placed with grandparents or with aunts and uncles who maybe have older children in the home or no children in the home. Um, uh, so the caregiver has to be fully aware of that problematic behavior. We can't just sort of place that child there and say, well, we don't want to share with the family what happened. We're just going to tell them they need to take care of Johnny for a while or Susie for a while. Um, they need to be aware of what kind of supervision is necessary, what the safety plans are. And remember, their involvement in treatment is key to these kids being successful in completing treatment and doing well. So we, we're going to want them to be involved. Um, when might it be important for us to put these kids in a residential type level of care? Well, when the behaviors are more serious, when it's more aggressive, um, when our community-based services have proven to be ineffective, when caregivers um, say that they're not able to provide the appropriate level of supervision, or um, we don't believe that they're going to be able to do it and, and sort of have demonstrated their their lack of believing that this kid is engaged in these behaviors, et cetera, or when the youth is engaging in other delinquent behaviors across other spheres in their lives. There's lots of other things kind of going on with them. Inpatient treatment might be warranted for our kids um, when they have serious psychiatric diagnosis also going on. Um, this self-harm and suicidality, please be aware that the detection of problematic sexual behavior or illegal sexual behavior at the time of detection when people find out about it, that is when our kids are at their highest risk to engage in um, suicidal behaviors or to die by suicide and may require hospitalization for stabilization, may also require safety plans around around that. So we do need to be aware of that. We do need to be thinking about that um, when we're looking at, at these children and do they require, um, and it might be they require a short-term period of stabilization in a psychiatric hospital because of other things that are going on with them or they need medication stabilized for them around other behaviors, impulse control behaviors, et cetera. Those kinds of things might be going on. Um, And when might it be necessary to put a, a youth in an incarcerated or a locked facility? Well, if there's significant histories of, of delinquent behaviors, serious aggressive defense offenses with multiple victims, um, when it, the youth's behaviors are across all spheres of their lives, both in the community, in school, and in the home, um, it's difficult to manage, govern, et cetera. Um, you know, laws are being broken in lots of different ways. It's not just sexual offense behaviors that we're seeing. All those things are important to kind of keep in mind. There's some risks with placing our youth outside of the home. Um, if you think of some of those risks that we talked about earlier, about frequent moves, et cetera, those are risks for our kids. Um, but also we know that when youth are, are placed in uh, facilities with other youth um, who've engaged in delinquent behaviors, that they may result in higher levels of future illegal behaviors. Um, and remember that separation from family may actually decrease parental involvement in their lives or in their treatment and their key to our kids doing better. So there's some real risks with placing our youth outside of, outside of the home. Um, let me ask you as a teenager, did you ever lie to your parents? And if you did lie, what was the reason that you lied to them? Think about these, this for a minute. 
because you know I'm I'm going to I'm going to suggest that um, the majority of you have probably lied to your parents. Um, particularly if you thought you were going to be in trouble. I would suggest that the majority of you would lie to or or not admit to a behavior when you got pulled over for speeding. Law enforcement comes up to you and says, do you know why I pulled you over today? Um, yeah, see, vast majority, 81% didn't want to get in trouble. 98% of you said that you did. 2% are lying to yourselves, <laughs> right, about lying to your parents. Um, we don't want to get in trouble. We don't know the consequences of getting in trouble, so it scares us, right? Um, we don't know what the other person knows about what we did. So there's reasons why our youth are maybe not being honest about the behaviors that they've engaged in. Um, so I just want you to think about this. What are kids, they've, they have a youth panel at Oklahoma of youth who have successfully completed treatment, and our youth are saying things like, care about me as a person don't just look at the behaviors that I've engaged in but take time to know me and all of me please listen to me don't be judge and jury on my behaviors listen to me understand me try to try to help me figure this out know that trust takes time um, I'm more surprised and 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 don't trust when a youth trusts me immediately that put kind of gets my uh, radar up right please know when I deny this behavior to you it's a result of fear. I don't know what the consequences are going to be. I don't know what's going to happen. And that scares me. So I'm going to deny this behavior, right? Um, please help me stay connected to my family. Being connected with them is very, very important to me. And when I lose my connection to them, um, the consequences and the outcomes are not good for me. And we do know that these youth are best treated in group treatment as opposed to individual treatment um, because the opportunity to learn from the other youth within groups with them is, is just has a, a great impact on, on their change. And we also know that parents themselves um, benefit from uh, being in groups uh, with other parents of youth who've engaged in these in, in problematic sexual behavior. Uh, what you can do when you're working with these families is convey to them that this is a serious behavior that they've engaged in, but that there's hope and there's help available. We've got to avoid the doom and gloom. This is not a life sentence for these kids. It's something that they did and something that we can work with. And remember, only 15% of them go on to engage in another behavior with no treatment whatsoever. So please communicate that hope, but also communicate the fact that this is serious. And we do have to take this seriously. It's not just kids being kids, right? Think about yourselves and think about what you would do if you were told your child had a problematic sexual behavior and keep that in mind when you're working with these parents. I'm just gonna kind of flip through this so you can see what some of our parents are feeling when they find out that their kids have engaged in these problematic sexual behaviors. Um, it's no surprise, right, that those range of emotions and feelings are, are all over the spectrum and, and, and we can't expect parents to engage or, or engage with us in any one particular way. They're feeling lots of different feelings and we have to take a moment to kind of assess what those feelings are. Um, my last poll for you guys, do you feel like you understand adolescents better now? True, false, or you're not sure? You Renee. won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, as we wrap things up, we did have a few questions come through. So um, we had two questions come through that um, hopefully we'll have a few moments to get to. So Okay. Thank you for the answers to that poll. And then there's one more. I feel better able to address adolescents with problematic sexual behavior now. And you can go ahead, Kaylin, while they're um, yes, this. so um, we did have someone ask regarding in terms of working with subgroups and see, so here's the question, how do you help clinicians and educators understand the injustice they demonstrate when they disregard um, or focus on problematic sexual behavior of youth in one group, but highlight it and report it, um, the same behavior in other groups and finding that how do you self-reflect on that implicit bias and becoming um, more, you know, able to apply this across groups and not necessarily focus on one group over another um, that are exhibiting the behavior? I mean, I, I think that that's a great question. And I think that there's a lot of factors that probably um, play into that decision and, and, and sort of the question and what you're talking about. 
Um, so I think we need to, you need to kind of tease out what those factors are, but I think education as a whole, community education, education to those providers that are signaling out one group as opposed to another, um, you know, pointing out the risk of, of, of not addressing it with all youth that are engaging in problematic behaviors um, and, and just providing good levels of education across the board um, may help sort of tease through some of that stuff. I hope that that sort Thank of you. helps. Yeah. Yes. And I know that there's been a lot of trainings made available um, and open access for that implicit bias and diversity and making sure everything is equitable and in terms of all work across the board. Um, and one final question we have is, does any part of the intervention or treatment involve the quote unquote victim um, in cases where the behavior was definitely problematic, but the victim either actively participated or didn't resist um, so that the victim does not engage with the quote unquote perpetrator. Hmm. Interesting question. Well, most of the, the work that we do with youth with problematic sexual behaviors, um, we're the the youth who's impacted by that behavior is not participating in the treatment. Uh, we want the impacted child also to be getting their own specialized treatment. Sometimes that's trauma treatment, sometimes that's psychoeducation, depending on if that youth is, is showing up as having, you know, on, having a high level of, of trauma as a result of what's happened to them. Um, but we do want them to also get individualized um, treatment. And we also need to, to think about, um, you know, reunification of families and what that might look like going forward and making sure that when we're putting those plans in place and we're doing that planning with those who are trained to be able to do that, um, that we're thinking about this, applying the same rules across the board to all children. Um, and in really keeping in mind the, the youth who's impacted and their level of safety and how they're feeling about, about reunification. Uh, we don't move forward with reunification unless the impacted child is is on board with that and and those working with that child feel that they're able to kind of move forward with it. Um, we do work within our groups around, um, you know, writing apology letters, et cetera, but those letters sometimes are shared with the impacted child um, and, and um, sometimes they are not. It really is a case by case situation, but we still have them go through and, and write a letter so that they can figure out sort of the impact that it, it did have on, on the youth um, that was impacted by those behaviors. Thank you so much, Renee, for that. And um, just in terms of wrapping up for that question, we do, we have dealt a little bit more in depth with, I know that was a very layered question. So we do invite you to check out our sexual behavior um, and series in other webinars. We have had Dr. Devlinger join us regarding um, overview of treatment for children impacted by the problematic sexual behavior of other youth. And earlier in our series, we also had Dr. Letourneau join us um, regarding um, problematic sexual behavior and those who are exhibiting those problematic sexual behavior and working with those youth. So thank you so much, Renee, for that great session. I know that was a lot of information and thank you so much for that. Um, so we want to let you know that if you have any questions or would like to follow up, we definitely invite you to reach out to um, that and all of our resources for that are available on our event page today, which is now um, on the screen. And I will now go over a few um, quick continuing education credit details for those wanting to um, obtain those for today's session. So the link to the evaluation um, where you can get your CE credit is available on the event page for today. When you visit the page, you will see a purple button like the one on the screen currently. When you click on that button, it will take you to the evaluation for today's webinar webinar as where you will let us know about um, the content and what you thought about today's session as well as the post test. For those wanting to obtain CE credits, after the evaluation you will be directed to a list of opportunities offered for today. Continuing education for social workers, licensed professional counselors, and licensed MFTs will be available through the University of Texas at um, Austin Steve Hicks School of Social Work, as well as credit for case managers through the Commission for Case Manager Certification. Contact hours will also be available for national 
National Council on Family Relations to CFLEs, and um, our MFLN offers certificates of completion for those hoping to obtain or um, track their professional development training or hours. Each participant seeking a certificate and CE credit will need to complete this process. If you have any issues with this process, um, you will need to score an 80% or higher for that if you are taking the post-test, but once you fill out all of those details, their certificate should be emailed to the provided email that you put in during that process within 24 to 48 hours. If you have not um, taken a post-test with MFLN before or an evaluation, we do ask that you check your spam folder first, but if you have not received that certificate, because sometimes um, providers will kick that to your spam folder, but if you do not receive that within 24 to 48 hours of completing that, we do ask that you email us at mflnfamilydevelopment at gmail.com and we will make sure um, Jason and I will work with you to make sure that you receive your certification. Um, we also invite you to join us for our next webinar that we are family development team will be hosting and for that we will be joined by some of our um, friends at Sesame Street to talk about a new suite of resources they have for racial literacy. And if you would like to stay updated, I know we had some questions regarding juvenile justice, and we actually will be having some webinars on that topic specifically regarding sexual behavior in children and youth a little bit later on this year. So we do invite you to subscribe to our mailing list if you would like to stay updated on our topics as they emerge and our webinars as they um, are upcoming. We also send day of webinar reminders as well as reminders announcing our webinars when we um, have those ready to roll. So. We invite you to subscribe to our mailing list if you would like to make sure that you stay tuned for all of that. And to officially wrap things up, I'm going to turn things back over to Coral. Thank you so much all for your participation today and for joining us for the session. Thanks, Galen, so much. And again, a big thank you to Renee for this incredibly rich session to everybody who contributed to our discussion today. We'll stay on for another minute longer in case you need to catch any of the links from the chat pod. Uh, but do be reminded that our one-stop shop for today's session is our event page. You can find these slides. You'll be able to find the recording in a day or two once we have it processed and posted. You're welcome to go back, review, share so much information here. Uh, and then you can also find all of the information, including the continuing education link on the event page as well. But of course, as Kaylin mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out to her and her team at mflnfamilydevelopment at gmail.com if you have any questions about the content or follow-up uh, questions or inquiries. So thanks again for tuning in. We wish you a great rest of your week, a great weekend. We look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Take care and have a great day. Hi, Ruth. I just saw your question. Yes, absolutely. You're welcome to share the recording. Like I said, um, the recording will be available on the event page in a day or two if you want to go back and check. Um, but this, uh, as well as all of our MFLN webinars, are available for public uh, access, and we welcome you to share. So thanks so much for thinking of that. All right, we're going to go ahead and close out the room. Thanks again for tuning in, folks. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Coral. Thanks, everyone.